Last time, we left off wondering how a few machine learning and statistics researchers in the 1970s and 80s were able to so dramatically outperform our brute force approach to finding the best rule to identify fingers and images. How is it that these researchers were able to find a needle in a haystack without searching through all the hay? Before we dive in here, we need to make a quick adjustment to our haystack analogy. There's probably more than one needle. As we learned back in part 7, machine learning is fundamentally ill-posed. There is no one correct answer. If we sort all the rules we've tested in our search for the best 3-pixel rule by the number of errors on our training set, we see that there is, of course, a best performing rule. But it's only a tiny bit better than our second best performing rule. And remember, our rule's performance on our training set is only half the picture. If we add test set performance for each rule to our plot, we see that our second best performing rule actually performs a little better out of sample. This is of course just a result of how our data was sampled. There's nothing magical about our second best performing rule. As we move further away from our best performing rule on our training set, we do see the trend we expect. Rules that don't do as well on our training set don't do as well on our test set. But the big point here is that any of our top 10 or 20 performing rules are equally valuable, given the limitations of our data. So our mission then is to find one of the best, not the single best needle in a haystack of 682,560 rules. Critically, the relaxation of this constraint, that we find the rule that offers the very best training set performance, is going to allow us to dramatically speed up our search process. We of course still have our work cut out for us. Finding one of 10 rules out of 682,560 is still no easy task. We can now really get to work. Let's return to our toy data for a moment and consider how we might speed things up. As we know, the real slowdown here is the huge number of rules we need to test. But why do we have so many rules in the first place? Why does the number of rules we need to test increase so dramatically as we increase the number of pixels in our rules? Why is our growth exponential? One way to visualize our growth is with a tree diagram. We'll use our tree to show our search for rules one pixel at a time. Our first pixel choice presents us with four pixels to choose from. We can show these options as branches on our tree. For each of our four possible pixels, we must then choose whether to look for a 1 or a 0 in that location. As we expand our search to two pixels, we must repeat this process for each of our eight branches, resulting in 48 total branches, corresponding to 48 possible two-pixel rules. So each time we add a pixel to our rule, all of our branches branch, resulting in the exponential growth we're all too aware of. This branching is of course much worse on our real 81 pixel data. Going from one to two pixel rules creates 160 new branches on each of our existing 162 branches. So we now have a perhaps slightly different perspective on our problem. If we're going to avoid searching through an exponentially large number of rules, we simply can't allow our search to branch out as it does as we add more pixels. So how did our machine learning and statistics heroes prevent this insidious branching? They did something that may sound foolish at first. At each level of our tree, they chose the best possible branch and forgot the rest. This approach extinguishes our exponential growth problem by somewhat haphazardly cutting off the great majority of the branches in our tree. This strategy undoubtedly results in far less computational burden. But the crucial question here must be, how can we possibly know if an entire branch will be good or bad after considering just one level of our tree? In short, we can't. There's no way to be 100% certain we aren't lopping off branches of our tree that contain high-performing rules. However, when implemented correctly, this method, generally called a greedy approach because at each level of our tree, it chooses one option that appears the best and never goes back to reconsider its decision, perform surprisingly well across a huge number of problems, including ours. The beauty of this greedy approach is that it cleanly, although imperfectly, 
breaks apart our intractable search problem into tractable subproblems. Instead of searching through an exponentially large set of rules, all we need to do is choose which branch to further pursue at each level. Now, greed alone is not enough. We still need some method to decide which branch is most promising at each level of our tree. Let's explore this on our toy data. Now that we've decided to simply ignore all branches but one at each node of our tree, we can greatly simplify our tree diagram. The resulting structure, a binary classification tree, splits into just two branches at each node. At each node of our tree, our data set is divided into two parts. And once our tree has perfectly separated our data, we're done. A nice result of architecting our trees this way is that we can search for multiple rules at once. Each branch that ends in a positive leaf can be converted into a rule. Now, how do we choose which variable to split on at each level? In some instances, like our toy data set, the choice is pretty clear. Given our four possible splits, splitting on x1 is clearly the way to go. This split is the only choice that cleanly divides our data into positive and negative examples. But of course, even in toy data land, life is not always so simple. What about this training set? Which variable should we split on? After a little investigation, splitting on x4 may seem promising, as it seems to almost cleanly divide up our data. We can easily imagine completely separating our data with just one or two more splits. Of course, the key to the efficiency of our greedy approach is that we only consider a single level of our tree at a time. So we aren't allowed to make our decision based on what may happen further down the tree. Fortunately, we can still make a good argument for splitting on x4. For each possible split, we can measure how well we're doing by counting the number of classification errors we make on our training data. A simple way to do this is to assign each node the label that corresponds to the majority of the examples it contains. And in the event of a tie, we'll just label the node positive. So in our x4 case, we'll label the left node negative and the right node positive, resulting in one misclassification error. Since all other splits make two misclassification errors, x4 is our winner. Notice that before we split, using our majority labeling approach, we would have labeled all examples as positive and made two misclassification errors. So splitting on variables x1, 2, or 3 kept our number of misclassifications exactly the same, while splitting on x4 reduced our number of misclassification errors from 2 to 1. So we now have a strategy. At each level of our tree, we'll split on the variable that misclassifies the fewest examples after labeling each node with the majority class label. Let's test out our new strategy on real data. But before we do, let's consider how our new strategy might perform. Our training set has 7,372 examples of non-fingers and 495 examples of fingers. As we saw with our toy data, if we simply call all of our examples non-fingers, we will make 495 errors by misclassifying all fingers as non-fingers. This is equivalent to our baseline strategy. Our new strategy depends on making fewer than this number of errors as a result of splitting on the right variable. Now, how do you think our approach will perform after splitting on a variable like x0? Will we do better, equal to, or worse than our baseline of 495 errors? What about a more central pixel, like x40? We'll discuss the answers next time.